with our brother, Brother Booker T. Coleman, uh, a student of our mighty scholar, uh, John Henry Clark, uh, who has uh, become an ancestor now, but whom we still uh, continue to celebrate. Uh, so you can consider this as part of that uh, celebration. Um, we're here to look into the role of the Shabaka stone in the discovery of the unified family. Yes. Uh, what I was saying basically was about the celebration which we were here for today. Uh, in honor of uh, Professor Henry uh, Clark, our teacher and elder, and now uh, an ancestor for us, who taught our beloved brother here right from the age of 12. Uh, and in his words, he had no choice but to do what he's doing right now. And we're quite delighted. Uh, the brother had studied the unified field theory account that was presented in our time press and somehow had made a connection with the Shabaka stone uh, which he would like to uh, share with us and in the process we can share that testimony which is certainly very, very spiritual, very, very important, and a very serious, if not critical, component of our uh, whole being as a people in terms of our history, in terms of the destiny that surrounds the unified field theory or the theory of everything where we are actually destined to come up with that theory and that's basically what we look forward to uh, brother Booker T. Coleman a distinguished citizen of Africa an excellent scholar to uh, share with us today Thank you, brother. Thank you, my brother, Dr. Yibo. And, and I am more, if not just as in awe of Dr. Yibo and what he has done. And as he said earlier, being a student of Professor John Henry Clark, I was introduced to culture and history. And being a teacher, everything I've ever learned, I've always tried to break it down on a child's level. And my strength in education has been being an early childhood teacher. Because in being an early childhood teacher, I've had to break things that would be very complex down on a very simple level. I've been studying this for a while. This is astronomy, this is physics, uh, all of which I was not interested in when I was growing up. The interest came when I understood that this was my history and my culture, our history and our culture. And I am in awe of Dr. Yibo because if justice is served, if Ma'at is righteous and is recognized, he will be a Nobel Prize winner. Because what he has done, literally, I know is correct. I'm not going to speak on others. I'm not going to uh, use other people. I'm going to directly deal with Dr. Yibo's work here. I do not have the math uh, mathematical background that Dr. Yibo has. However, in looking at it, at his formula, I know it's correct by the variables that he's given, by the letters that he has given to each essence, and by studying this Shabaka stone. Shabaka was a pharaoh of the 25th dynasty. I'm afraid of dates because we're going to find out that we're much, much older than we really are. However, using what we have today, you know, if you can't get to the star in the long distance, what you do is you hook up with every short distance star until you get to your long distance. So we're going to use with what we have now to try to reach back and touch fundamental. What Dr. Yibo has done, put down on paper, literally will change the way humanity thinks. 
I would even dare say it will usher in a new level beyond Homo sapiens sapiens. But more importantly than that, I think we will remember our history. Much of what Dr. Ayibo has done with all of my, my admiration, I think he is recalling, he is remembering what we have forgotten as a people. The Ma'afa, this period of enslavement, has put us in the lack of a sleep. Many of us are coming up out of this sleep, and I think that while this seems futuristic, it really was our past. And I think that we have devolved as a human people because we've allowed people who know not to tell us what they think they know. And what Dr. Yibo has done is changed the way in which we look. This will change the way people think. This will change the way in which we act. This will change the way buildings look. This will change the way in which we talk to each other, the way in which we build things, the way in which we do things. Because when you come in contact with something such as the Shabaka Stone, it changes fundamentally your thought pattern. You cannot think the same way. Shabaka Stone, they say, was written approximately 710, 710 years before the Christian era by a Pharaoh Shabaka of the 25th dynasty. However, in all of this, what you notice is that there are two horizontal lines that go across. There are approximately 62 that go down. And between line 24 and 46, it's almost obliterated because the people, when they found this, this was found and people used this as a tethering stone. In other words, when you wanted to uh, ground grain, you would put the grain on a rock and put another rock and then beat the rock. Well, this was, one of the, this was the bottom rock. So it is obvious that the peoples living in Egypt today could not have been the masters of this work, for if they had been, they would have known never to do something like that. So it's obvious that the people who did this were no longer in the land or were not in control of the land. So it is of an African origin, the 25th dynasty. The first two lines written by Shabaka tell of how they came upon what is known as the Memphite text, which is the original text. And because we know that our, our comedic ancestors wrote on either papyrus and sometimes on leather, we know that Shabaka is saying that it was worm-eaten, but that it was such a dynamic scientific treatise on the coming into being of the universe, it was too important to let it go into oblivion. So he had his scientists and his artists rewrite it in stone. So you get the, the concept of it's written in stone. In other words, it's permanent. This is where the concept comes from. Shabaka was saying, we will write it in stone for all posterity so that it will never be taken away from us. And it's so interesting that even though they beat it to death, it still came alive. This story tells of how the universe came into being. It tells of how all and everything were in the waters of Nun in the very beginning, matter. And that at some point in time, rising through the water came Ptah. Dr. Ayibo has also done a great deal of work on turbulence. Turbulence, as I saw it, and again, what's going to be great about this conversation is I'm learning. I'm not here to lecture or to preach. I'm here to learn from Dr. Oyibo from a mathematical perspective what I am theorizing, what is known as metamath by Dr. Theophilio Benga and Dr. Sheikh Antadiyaf. Those thoughts that come into your mind before you write it down. I have thoughts, but he has written it down. I'm hoping to share my thoughts to see where it fits in all of this. So as we go through this, we'll learn how all of this occurred. Because of the nature, I would just like to back off and just get deeper into the conversation because I think that I've pretty much finished my introduction. Um, but I am very happy to be here. And it's been months and months since I've been saying to Dr. Yibo that we need to get together because, again, I have his book. And the brother did great work to get me on discount. But if you knew how much his math book cost, I mean, it's an expensive... I mean, Dr. Yibo, it was $125. And he got me discount. So you know I bought two. <laughs> because I don't know, let nothing happen to this. But when I read his book on turbulence, turbulence <clears throat> is pata. It is the primordial scission. From my mind, it is that first inkling where something comes from nothing. Because there is no such thing as nothing in the African world. Nothing is something that you can't see. But nothing is still something. In the English language, nothing becomes nothing. 
But that can't exist in the universe because everything is something within the universe. Even if it cannot be seen, it is something. It's just unseen something. So we're dealing with the unified field theory, which I truly believe is as defined by the Shabaka stone, the waters of Nun. That to me is what the unified field theory is, or what is known as GUT, G-U-T, the grand unified theory. Einstein claimed to have died trying to find it. And I'm saying had he just looked to Africa, he would have found it. So that on one level, Dr. Yibo's work, the grand unified theory, this formula, is Nun. His book on turbulence is Pata, and Atum is the consciousness that comes forward when you understand the grand unified theory and turbulence. Now we need specificity from Dr. Yibo in terms of math. Let's get it on. Dr. Lingo, uh, yes. I just want to interject one thing. That, uh, later on, when people are looking at this, they will better understand exactly uh, what unified theory is. So if you could explain that in terms of what it is that we're really looking at. Uh, yes. Well, the unified field theory uh, is a theory uh, embedded in the human spirituality in reality um, that was supposed to uh, show the connection, the unified position of all the forces that says the forces, if they're called forces, just like the human family, you should have the same origin. Okay, if you're a human being, you must have some kind of origin, uh, common origin. Uh, Africans have the same great grandparents, and uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So forces are therefore thought to have a common origin, except that. The sciences, as they have it, have not been able to show that common origin. They will study those forces separately. They will see the effects. You know, a uh, few cases they have commonalities. Other times, they're separate. So the principle then of the unified field theory is to unite all the forces. What are those forces? Well. Uh, in reality, <coughs> the humanity doesn't know all the forces, but they claim to have identified four, which are the gravity, gravitational force, which holds the planets and the universe together. Um, then you have uh, the electromagnetic field, you know, force which holds, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have the electric fields and magnetic fields, they, you know, they're responsible for energy production and so on and so forth. It's a very unique kind of field that moves electrons and all kinds of subatomic particles and, and, and any object that has uh, elements of uh, electric or magnetic field or components in them. Then the th uh, third category, or which are actually two, are the, uh, the so-called strong forces and the weak forces. Uh, the strong force binds together the repelling uh, components of the human, I mean the the universe system, uh, you know, uh, for example, if you have two magnets, you have, you know, uh, the like poles would repel, okay, and unlike would uh, attract. And so what happens is when you have those together, they will be bouncing away. That's a very, very f strong kind of situation where they try to push one another away. So if you can imagine a force that will 
keep them together, force them together, that is the one that's called the strong force. Um, at the same time, there are other subsystems of the universe that may not be repelling as much. They have minimal repel repulsion. They may have even some attraction, but they still need to be kept together. They could even be neutral bodies. They don't really attract, but they need to stay together. You know, they don't attract or repel, but, you know, they need to be staying together. Um, the force that keeps those kinds of components together is called the weak force. So these are the four that have been identified uh, up until this point uh, by, you know, scientists and mathematicians and physics. Um, so there has been uh, a study uh, through generations uh, of humanity. And what Brother Booker is basically addressing here in, in terms of the connection with the Shabaka, given its historical, uh, uh, you know, time kind of uh, uh, setting, is that it was always there in the Shabaka stone. But uh, in relatively recent times, yes, yes, I was finishing uh, the definition of the, the uh, yeah. weak, 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 weak force and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the fact that uh, humanity has been looking for it. And basically, uh, the relatively short past, um, the people with the solution, of course, had been uh, under siege and under uh, all kinds of uh, trying moments, and so uh, have been put in a position that they were not really looked upon as um, the ordained source of that knowledge. Um, like uh, Brother Booker had pointed out, um, the solution had been, you know, buried already in the Shabaka stone. And it would then seem that there is uh, uh, some level of destiny then that uh, the African, uh, wherever he or she is, was supposed to come up and show, share that with the world. But because the African, ironically, was the least expected to do that due to one uh, lack of information or another, they were not considered at all. As a matter of fact, <coughs> physics and mathematics, especially mathematics, uh, which our ancestors uh, uh, were used as a source to bring it to the world by the Almighty God, uh, you will be surprised to know the level of African people getting degrees in those areas. Uh, certainly in physics is quite similar. Um, uh, of course, as is very clear in history, geometry was what our ancestors did probably better than anyone uh, that has lived on the surface of this earth. Not only did they do the theoretical developments, but they practicalized it in terms of the pyramid and, you know, uh, you know stuff like the Shabaka stone and and the use of lasers and sophisticated kind of uh, uh, incredible uh, dimensions and extensions of, you know, mathematics or geometry beyond uh, uh, the level that most people are familiar with. Uh, it's, uh, it's as if it's actually a spiritual expression, uh, which is why uh, 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 the English author, Okay, uh, 
uh, who wrote a book, The Fingerprints of the Gods, Hancock, you know, said, called the book The Fingerprints of the Gods. In other words, that the awe which overwhelmed him in looking at the practicalization of geometry, okay, and the other sciences by our ancestors, were so high, such a high level, that he couldn't simply believe that that could be done by human beings. That's a testimony to the kind of um, sophistication and, and God's blessing uh, that had been bestowed on our ancestors. But ironically, <clears throat> in the present time, uh, it's hard to uh, uh, see the evidence of that in terms of the number of graduation of uh, people of African descent in mathematics or, or geometry or uh, physics or even chemistry. The name chemistry, you know, is actually the science of the chemetic people. That's where the word came from. Chemistry, chemet, chemet, chemistry. Um, you know, and when you put math and chemistry together, you get physics. Okay, so there are quite a bit of evidence in terms of uh, uh, historical and even, uh, you know, goes beyond history in terms of the spiritual, um, uh, you know, uh, sign that says, yes, these are the people that were actually ordained to bring such information, you know, and, and the importance of a unified force is actually going back to the concept of the Almighty God because that's the most awesome force. And, you know, when you're looking for a unified force, you are indeed looking for the Almighty God, the Creator. Uh, you know, you know, uh, that's the author of force. That is the, uh, the entity behind any motion um, that exists in the universe. And so unified force is, is the world. Unified force is the universe. Unified force is the embodiment of creation. And that's why it is so important. Um, you know, we can transform within a conservation, as we talked about, uh, but, but that we are basically uh, part of that unified force. Okay, we could go from one form to another, but, you know, we, uh, you know, come from one uh, original source. And that's basically what the search for unified field theory is about. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, it takes some history. It takes some, the current realities uh, in education and the university systems where, for example, in my search, uh, when I was starting out for uh, mentors uh, in terms of uh, people of African descent, uh, it was basically non-existent. Um, you know, so like I said before, um, this development is thoroughly unexpected. Uh, to the world. No person would have ever guessed in their slide in the in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in any way that it would be somebody of African descent that was gonna tell the story. And as I've shared with most people that I talk to, uh, the reason that is the case is because uh, the ancestors, you know, have the case of the truth. And so the rest of us who came later, uh, one way or the other, would continue that to tell that truth. And so, you know, this is the contest uh, in which we're discussing the unified field theory. Uh, that, you know, because it's a central force within the creation itself, it has so many implications. Uh, like I said, when you can link it to the 
force of creation itself, which is the Almighty God, then you can understand what I'm talking about. Um, people, for example, want to go back to understand creation. You know, is it the Big Bang Theory? You know, what happened when time, uh, the original, when the time began, okay? And so you can see then how it is important not only to find the unified field theory, but to use that theory to go back in time to actually get a better sense of how the creator actually created the universe. Okay? So it's not a trivial uh, uh, matter. It's not a trivial undertaking. Uh, it's not a frivolous one either uh, in terms of its importance. So it is within that context that, uh, you know, I began my search. Um, very young when I started, as I mentioned in the interviews before, uh, basically in the high school. But before then, the, the elders who I studied under had already been giving me a lot of uh, information in terms of, uh, you know, my position, you know, as a uh, people, as a member of a people, of a race, uh, what my job was supposed to be. Um, you know, by looking back and seeing things, I guess I must say that um, I may have been uh, quite fortunate, you know, to have that kind of education and information, um, which of course uh, made <coughs> my search a lot uh, more um, focused and more, ins you know, inspiring and more energetic for me. So, um, so of course, it began, you know, formally or semi-formally at the high school level. Okay, um, but even in elementary school, you know, I I tried a few things. Uh, you know, you know, thought-wise in terms of thinking about, you know, what to do with mathematics and so on, to you know, to go you know, along that direction. I didn't, didn't formally know it at that time, but I knew, you know, somehow that was where I was headed. Um, so then, in the high school, uh, one of the early things that I remember in the high school was uh, taking a formula. Uh, which I've shared with many people, they, uh, if you were adding numbers from one to any number, you will, for example, one plus two is three, one plus two plus three is six, uh, you know, suppose you continue doing that, you know, um, let's say you want to add up to a hundred. Of course, if you have uh, some time and paper and pencil, you can do it. I mean, you know how it can be done, okay? Um, but uh, if you don't have time, you just you just just think about it and say, yeah, it can be done. But <laughs> I don't have time to do it right now. So, so then what I wanted to know is how I could have find a simple way that you know to do that. And so that took me into sitting down and try to find a formula, a mathematical formula, which in many ways is transformation. You transform that tedious problem into a form that's also geometry. That's the gift of the ancestors. You transform it into a space where it is easy to do, okay? And so, after struggling with it for a couple of days, I came up with a formula, which was, if the number that you're stopping was n, you know, as an arbitrary number, then, 
the sum adding the number from 0 or 1 to that number n will be equal to n over 2 multiplied by n plus 1. Okay? And I did that, and then I plugged in n over 2 multiplied by n plus 1. Um, so, of course, if you add 1 plus 2, you get 3. So, 1 plus 2 means that you're stopping at 2. So, 2 over, over 2 is 1. 2 plus 1 is 3. So, 3 times 1 is 3. That's the answer right there. And you can plug in any number, even a million, okay, which certainly even a computer will would take some little time to do that. But there is one that will make could take the computer an impossible time to do. Okay? But this formula can do it. Because all you need is, you know, you you find a number where you start, suppose it's ten to power uh, a million. Okay? Ten to power a million. <laughs> That's certainly, that's going to take a computer a lot of time to do that. But all you need is, you, you have your 10 to power a million, you divide it by 2, add 1 to it, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe I don't, yeah, okay, the formula that I'm talking about is, okay, okay, thank you. What I'm talking about is uh, the sum, if you're adding 1 plus 2 plus 3, plus to n, okay? Say that that is equal to, okay, s of n. s of n is equal to n over 2 plus n plus 1. This is what I found in the high school. And like I said, if, let's say n was equal to 10 to power a million, okay? To 10 to power 6. You try, you try giving that to the computer, though. I mean, let the computer add that kind of number. That's going to be horrible. But technically, you will have that as S 10 to power, 10 to power 6 is equal to, you just substitute it here, 10 to power 10 to power 6 over 2 into 10 to power 10 to power 6 plus 1. That's an answer. The computer will have a difficult time trying to do that. So it will be crunching, you may run out of energy before it gets to do that. So, so that is the power of transformation, okay? This is a transformation. You've transformed this difficult problem into a space where it's very neat and simple. And that's the basis of the unified field theory. It turned out that this formula that I did in high school was the same formula when I took it to my teacher. Um, I guess he was a Frenchman. He looked at it and he basically, uh, he gasped and I think he almost had a heart attack when he saw that. He was the mad teacher. And he said to me, do you know what you just did? And I said, no, I don't know. I thought I just found the formula. <coughs> and he said, does the name Gauss mean anything to you? This is Gauss. Does the name Gauss mean anything to you? I said, no, I have no idea who he is. But he says, Gauss is considered along with Newton okay, um, and Euler. Of course, he was a European, or he's a European. These are the greatest mathematicians of all time, Gauss, Newton, Euler. And that uh, this guy came to fame by finding this formula. Mm. This was his uh, thing to do. To, it's claimed to, fl to fame, as they say. So how did you do it? He says to me, I said, I just sat down and I, I looked at that and I, I, I put that end down and I tried to 
do some little serious thing, and that's what came up. So uh, from then, of course, I would uh, earn a nickname of Mr. Kyle Kills. <laughs> that was my nickname in high school. By the time, of course, I got to 10th grade, uh, I was, I became a teacher of calculus, okay? So you would have thought that I was going to be teaching, you know, ninth grade is where people start calculus, teach ninth grade. But I wasn't teaching ninth grade. I was not teaching 10th grade. I was teaching 12th grade. And actually it was what they call popular, popular uh, demand uh, by the people in the 12th grade who were my seniors. And the boarding school that I went to, being a senior was a very significant thing. Uh, I had to wash their clothes, at least up until that point. You know, uh, I do the laundry for them. I mean, you know, because they were two years ahead of me. In fact, even 11th graders, you know, who would, that's the tradition in the high school. So, but when it came to being a teacher, they had no problem, you know, uh, you know, say, yeah, let that young man come and teach us calculus. So they would take me there. And, uh, but I was rather small. Uh, so I will, there was a little chair that I have to stand on to give my lessons. Uh, but it was fun, you know, they had fun just as I had fun. So, but, you know, this name stood with me uh, throughout. As a matter of fact, there are some of my classmates that still address me with that name. Uh, one wrote me a letter a couple of years ago and still remember that even after 30 something years. So, this, the kinds of circumstances that surround the search, but part and parcel of this kind of development in terms of uh, mathematics is the, the philosophy from the elders, the African philosophy, which was luckily quite, uh, you know, uh, alive and well in the environment that I grew up. Okay, you were taught your history. You were taught who you were. You were taught about the war you lost 500 years ago. Okay, and how you became a POW a set of POW, you know, three categories. One that were left on the continent, one that were dumped in the Atlantic Ocean, and one that came to uh, the New World and other places. And so you, you know, in other words, you were geometrically and spiritually in a plane where you, you had information. You, you were quite <laughs> um, and then the other thing they would have us do is to trace our ancestry, okay? Uh, you know, um, you know, back as far as you can, okay? I can easily trace mine to 1100, and by projection back to the pyramid, yes, the, uh, Egypt, okay? And so every young person to show that you grew up well, that you came, you are a true black person, you're an African, and that knows him or herself, you have to embark on doing stuff like that. So you're not just uh, black and proud, per se. You're black and proud because of the glory of the Almighty God that blessed you with so much. Okay, so much food, so much knowledge, so much mathematics, so much civilization in the cradle of civilization, so much history, so much love for humanity and all that. So you got to go through this. Uh, and what that does is really keep you continuously in a state of positive uh, uh, experience. And that, you know, nourishes your development. It, it energizes you in terms of uh, your growth uh, 
academical and spiritual and so on. So all that added to the search for the unified field theory. So with things like this, um, I would move on to the university. And one of the pieces that was done in the undergraduate was um, a study of the rocket. Um, I did in a in a book called it's not a, it's a published book, okay. Okay, the gas turbine testing, okay, by myself. I basically studied the principles of rocketry and how math plays a role in that. Okay? And I remember a professor by the name of Professor uh, Peter Wojcik. Wojcik. Okay? A very brilliant Polish professor described this piece as a masterpiece. Those were his word, th that was his word in describing the gas turbine testing. Um, so <clears throat> again, there was an application of mathematics, the philosophy, the African philosophy, and you know, and, 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 and the, the appreciation of what the giver of knowledge, who is the Almighty God, um, has done. So then we moved on from there. At this point, of course, one of the things that I was quite interested in doing was making sure that the gifts that seem to be apparent in my system with mathematics was not just trivialized by people who look at mathematics as some form of abstract uh, thing you know, that has no use except for some trivial uh, uh, a self gratifying kind of uh, feeling, you know, that you're supposed to get from abstract mathematics. Okay? So, for example, getting that formula um, to me had a lot of practical implications. It isn't just some abstract thing, it has, like I showed, the comparison between that formula and the computer there is certainly an advantage. So then, I wanted to make sure that people did not misunderstand my role as a math, a person that studies mathematics. I did not, I hated being written off as some, you know, somebody abstract that has no impact on uh, the humanity or, or, or practical situations. So I made sure that whenever I develop the mathematics, I would look for an application. This was the first practical uh, uh, part, you know, in terms of you know the university years, okay? Because what happened was, yeah, what happened was that, yeah, I probably need to cover it. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, what happened was that the math helped me see rocketry, because this basic book here deals with rocketry, gave me an insight into rocket science. And to, again, get back to my base as an African in terms of where such an idea could have come from. Um, Later on, I would come across the name of Andrew J. Beard. 
an African born in this country who had no formal education, invented the rotary engine, okay, um, rotary engine, which is the, uh, the basically the, the principle of the rocket. And the interesting part about uh, Brother Beard was the fact that they said that he didn't have any formal education. So then you ask yourself, how does a person walk off the street or walk off his, his mother's womb and, and create a revolution of this type? Of course, he is an African. That was a good beginning. They come to find out there is a toy, in other words, trying to explain this revolution, there is a toy called Chico. Which is an advanced toy for an African child. Okay? And Chico is, is something of this. Okay? Something like that. And it's got. It's got an ins you know, another component like that, okay? Um, this is cylindrical, and this is also a little cylindrical, and it's got a piston type thing here. And what happens is you can insert a bullet-like thing over here at the, you know, it's hollow. It's uh, like a bamboo or something like that they, 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 use, they build it from. So you have this piston here and, they, you know, the handle. And it, there's some brush at the end of the piston, okay? So you could move it in and move it out. The brush serves as a valve. There's a valve there that when you're going in, there is a compression of air if you allow air in to begin with. And then when you come out, of course, you know, uh, you know it, it expands and so on. So this is a toy that an African child uses. And what happens is, with this bullet in there, you can compress enough air in here to project, as, uh, send this out as a projectile, okay? Or like a bullet, okay? So I looked at that, and I said, my goodness, then probably it's a relationship with that, the cheekbone, and the rotary engine, that occurring in Africa, and this man being an African, if he didn't have a formal education, the only education he had was what his father and great-grandfather taught him, um, which is the African education. And so there was a theory that says that is linked to Chikbo. So again, rotary engine connecting with gas turbine, and then with cheek well. uh, Of course, for most people who understand the uh, good part of the other history of the African, in terms of the pyramids and so on and so forth, that is not far-fetched. That's a neat kind of thing. So this was the kind of thing that one picks up as you move on in the search for unified field theory. Every time you get something of this kind, there is a reinforcement in your, in your efforts uh, in terms of your determination to get the job done. Um, so we moved on from there. By the end of this project, after having demonstrated, especially with this guy here, fine professor, Professor Wojcik, calling this work a masterpiece, that was, that was uh, well appreciated, and then energized me further. So then got into a field called, you know, a field of transformation called affine transformations. Uh, while actually 
in high school, what I would do is, you know, in terms of my search for the unifying field theory, first I wanted to understand the relativity theory. And I remember every time I would go to the library, I would go to that section, you know, of physics and mathematics where, you know, uh, uh, there would be books on physics and relativity. And this time I would pick that up, but the other kids would laugh at me. Um, even all the grown-ups would laugh at me and say, what a crazy guy, look at the kind of crummy book he's looking at. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Michelson and Morley experiment in terms of ether and all that, I would read that over and over. And the, the Lorenz uh, geometry, you know, quite vivid, you know, I remember the books, you know, um, uh, Dover type books, you know, that were in 11. I would read that over and I would, you know, and um, I'd say, gee, you know, wouldn't it be nice if one can go beyond uh, where they are? You know, I would read them and just get information and move on. So eventually, um, the field of pra uh, transformation called the affine transformation, transformation, <coughs> I began to get into that. Of course, that's the same transformation that Lorentz used in explaining the special relativity. That developed, and in the process, of course, I met with uh, a professor uh, you know, in my uh, graduate years. Actually, yeah, my, uh, my graduate years. I met with a professor, a very renowned professor, uh, called Eugene Brunel, E.J. Brunel. And Jim Brunel got all kinds of awards in MIT, became uh, one of the youngest professors to ever be appointed at Princeton University. In fact, one of his students uh, became the chairman of Grumman Aerospace. Uh, Renzo Caporelli was his PhD student at uh, Princeton University. Um, so I met him, and you know he was quite advanced in affine transformation studies. Had developed some really neat uh, stuff, and so I began to work with him along with some very notable other mathematicians like George Handelman, you know Bob Lowy, and uh, Henry Nagamatsu. These are some of the finest uh, scientists and mathematicians that I was blessed to work with. So in the process, we wrote some, you know, PhD thesis that <clears throat> did a lot of uh, analysis of affine transformations from geometric, spiritual, uh, aeronautical, and all kinds of dimensions. And that work received a lot of uh, how can I say the praise from the mathematics and engineering communities because it has application to aeronautics. So that again energized me quite a bit. And so the fact that it had been used in relativity was always there behind, you know, in my mind. Something that was used in relativity that is quite abstract could indeed uh, have applications in aeronautics, you know, designing airplanes to be safe. Um, um, you know, so, so, uh, so what? So, so then, so I said, gee, there must be more to affine transformations because what affine transformation did in relativity was to really explain the you know the concept of uh, special relativity which in a in a specific form which is the wave equation is a well known equation in mathematics <clears throat> but in terms of explaining physics 
the special relativity calls for a transformation of that wave equation into a certain mathematical space. And this affine set of transformation that the special one that Lorentz chose could transform that equation in such a neat way that the character, the properties of the waves were preserved. Okay, there was no changes at all. And that was also one very significant. In the process, of course, he explained what special relativity was talking about to the uh, uh, joy of Albert Einstein. Um, so, and of course, that energized Professor Einstein to go further, you know, into this uh, general relativity, uh, you know, and beyond. And so I took note of that, but my first application, of course, was the aeronautical application in aeronautics, where obviously there are some significant problems. Um, you know, uh, most people may not realize the, uh, the connection, tight one, for that matter, that exists between what you call physics and aeronautics. Aeronautics is the physics of gases and, and, and bodies that fly, you know, through air and so on. And so it's very much like studying physics, for one thing. Air is basically composed of particles, uh, you know, molecules of uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, oxygen mixture. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at the flow, it's like looking at particle physics, um, you know, and especially when it gets into the rare, rarefied uh, region, uh, mode, then, of course, you're really looking at the particle. So the equations, the same equations are used to describe those kind of aeronautical systems. So it was not totally um, unconnected what was happening there. It was studying physics. So, um, so that development received a lot of attention. Um, in fact, in terms of research citation, the last time I count, we had, uh, I, I noticed that I had over 100 citations, uh, you know, in terms of other researchers using, you know, uh, works like those are fine transformation works and, and the current work and so on and so forth. And 100 citations is, uh, uh, is not uh, a, bad, a bad number at all. Um, so, so then the mother equations, which are the, uh, the generic universal conservation equations, identifying them as the unified field equation or the theory of everything, or the uni law. The uni part, or the one equation part, is the fact that there, there, there may be five. Einstein showed there are actually four. This development shows there's one. And if there's only one equation that people are looking for that describes everything, and we took the equation for everything and transforming it to one, then it seems to me that those one equations are same and one. Um, and that's basically uh, the summary. You know, Hotep, one of the things that Dr. Yebo was talking about, particularly uh, towards, towards when he was summarizing, was the concept of a mother equation that at one point in time, everything was one, just one. And then out of that, everything came out of it. Just as atoms join nucleically and become molecules according to what the energy of the electron is, determines what will come out. The concept is, is the way back to the future is to be able to find out the common origin of everything and all. Now, the Shabaka stone has three philosophies. The first philosophy, this is the Shabaka stone.
The first philosophy of the Shabaka stone is called the primate of the essences. This is right as this is the privilege that I take to do this. Essences, of course, are spelled with a C. That there's always a smaller S, but I tend to do this because I want to get the sense of an essence, that there's a sense, and that the primate is the first, the origin, the beginnings of everything and all. Now, I'd like to keep in mind what Dr. Yibo's talking about, about that mother principle, about that one essence from whence everything comes out of, but that at, at a point in time, prior to this Pataian impact, be prior to this first turbulence, prior to the first movement that everything and all resides in the waters of Nuz. Now when he talks of the wave theory and he talks about the wave concept, our, it, it is said, and this is of course my research, everything and all is made up of waves. Everything comes in discontinuous straight lines, in other words, waves. Everything exists. I hear so-called physicists and others talking about the string theory. Okay, that is what they say everything is made up of. Well, our chemetic ancestors had waves as being all and everything. And that at this point in time, everything resides in the waters of Nun. In other words, the concept of hydrogen. Unlike any water that we know of today, we're not talking about the waters that we know of today that we drink or that the rain, or, it is a unique sort of hydrogen plasma, an almost spiritualized matter. This is what I believe is the unified field theory symbolically, the waters of none. This is the mother equation, not the math part. That is what Dr. Ayibo works on. That's what mathematicians and physicists work on. From a theoretical perspective, from a symbolic perspective, this is the symbol for the letter N in Meduneter, or hieroglyphs. When you elongate it, it becomes the waters of Nun. This is why this is like two ends. This is where we get our alphabet from, directly from Meduneter, which then became a scriptic language known as Heratic, and also had its demotic. But this is where all of this comes from, the waters of Nun. The Chemites in the Shabaka stone say that at some point in time, rising up out of the waters of Nun, at some appointed and anointed time in cosmic reality, in God's time, that there rose a primordial hill that was called Ptah. Ptah. Ptah is that turbulence, that point in time when energy at rest or potential energy which is in the waters in the very beginning, the potential for life is in the waters. However, it has not actualized itself yet. So therefore, potential energy, energy at rest, then converts itself to energy in motion. This energy in motion makes Patar rise up out of the hill. Now, this is a metaphor. This is a story. This is a theory. However, in this theory are the scientific principles, I believe, that Dr. Ayibo has written down on paper. This is why it's so important. Rising up out of the waters of Nun, <coughs> through the energy and power of Patar, coming up out of Patar and sitting atop Patar. Now, what's so important about that is that in sitting on Patar, the theory that our comedic ancestors are saying is that Atum had to separate itself from Patar. However, at the same time, it joined onto Patar and became what would be later called the unmoved mover. Atum. Atum to the Greeks, they said, was indivisible. But they themselves proved themselves wrong later on by being able to break it into protons, neutrons, and electrons. And there are those that even break it down into quarks and leptons in, in, in Yang and Mills field. Again, I'm not trying to impress you with this because I didn't know this. I've learned this. And I've learned this because I've been exposed to my culture. And we are saying that when our children are exposed to their culture, they will want to learn this. See, because the Galileos and, and with respect to all of the others, they got it from us. 
because they come upon at a time when the Moors are just being driven out of Europe. So where did they, where did the so-called renaissance come from? How can you have a renaissance if you've never had a naissance? That's the true miracle. How can you be reborn if you've never been born? The Moors, once again, coming into Africa, teaching these Europeans, I'm sorry, coming into Europe, teaching Europeans of the math and science. In fact, they even taught them how to speak Greek. That's how they even studied Aristotle in the first place. It was the Moors that translated this into um, a language that could be understood. Now, here is where, when Dr. Yibo talks about the powers, the four, four is a very important number in many African nations. Particularly when you take four and then you make pairs from the four. So not only do you have the four, but you have the essences of the opposing factors of each four. So it's more than just having something. You have something and it's nothing counterpart. Or that something that cannot be seen, which Dr. Yibo talks about as the hidden or the unseen force. The next, this is the primate of the essence. This is philosophy number one of the Shabaka stone that was rewritten on an older document known as Memphite text. Now we have the second philosophy, which we are calling the, essence, the essences of pre-existing order and arrangement. <clears throat> now, the reason why I use this term, because this in science, in math, philosophy, however you want to look at it, is also called <coughs> the Ogdo. The Ogdo. This that we teach in science, in all of these textbooks, same thing written on the Shabaka stone. But in the Shabaka stone, like many African, like a lot of African literature, it is written in figurative language. Therefore, if you look at it literally, you're going to see it as a fairy tale. However, if you're scientifically inclined, you'll read through the metaphor into the scientific principles that this metaphor, this allegory, this analogy, this story is masking. Atun. We still have the same primate, but this primate, Atum, calls into being <coughs> four pairs. The first pair is Nun and Nunet. Important because at this point, Nun is unnamed. See, remember in all of the holy books, it talks about God being on the face of the waters, but because God, the spirit, the energy doesn't know itself, cannot call itself into being, it must create creatures that will know God. So at this point in time, Nun cannot call him herself into being. It doesn't have the energy, so therefore it creates within itself, this mother equation creates within itself the ability. But the first step is not just doing it, it's a process. It is a, as Dr. Yibo talks about, a transformation, which to the Chemites is called Kepra. It is symbolized by the dung beetle, the metaphor. So, Nun Nunet comes into being through the naming of Atum, or the self-created one, because that is what Atum, from the comedic perspective, we believe means. Nunet is the counter heavens, or the space. You see, the, the law of opposites is, in, is happening. Dogon called this twinness, and they too have four pairs in their creation story. So does Congo. They have four pairs. You can go throughout Africa, and in many ways there is a repetition. There is a pattern mm -hmm. in the thought process of the theory of the creation of the universe. But however simplistic it may be, it has within it deep, complex philosophies. And one of the most brilliant things about our ancestors is that they took such deep thoughts and made it so that if you were a farmer, you could understand it. If you were a shepherd, you could understand it. If you made shoes, you could. Everything in your life could be brought into being through, as Dr. Yibo talks about, the mother equation. So therefore, the mother equation applies to everything in the universe according to the relationship that essence has with the greater force or the universe. Very simple, very brilliant, very much to what we teach our children but because we don't look at Medunete or African language through metaphor, through figurative language, through personification and symbol, mm -hmm. we miss the scientificness of what it is that they're saying, and we dismiss it as some fairy tale <coughs> or some religious allegory. But deep within it is God, 
yes, but also sacred. You have the spirit, you have the material. You have the sacred, you have the science. The second pair that was called into being, ha, ha het. Ha being infinity, and ha het being finity. In other words, within the universe, the parameters of the universe, there is the water, the material, there is the space or the counter heavens. Now, now what's growing is the concept of the idea of things never having an end and things having an end. The next pair was called into being, remaining in the waters of Nun, was Kuk and Kuket, darkness and light, star power, solar power. The, the essence of the superclusters, the clusters, the galaxies, the solar systems, the, all the celestial bodies were held within the context of this story coming out. That which can be seen in terms of light and that which cannot be seen. And then the final pair, called into the waters of Nun, Amen and Amenet. The hidden and the revealed. These are the four pairs that were called, and they, they remained in the waters of Nun. Now check this out. They remained in the waters of Nun as frogs and snakes. Why frogs? Well, frogs, their metamorphosis. In fact, the reason why we study frogs in biology class is because their central nervous system and our n nervous system is almost identical. That is why we use frogs. I mean, why don't we use other animals when we dissect things to find out in biology what we look like? Well, if that's true, that means that our ancestors understood the relationship between the physiology, the body of a frog, and the body of humanity, which again goes back to Dr. Ayibo's concept of being able to find a mother principle. How could a frog and a human be so much alike? Well, if you even look at the development of a frog from the egg to the tadpole to the frog, you're actually watching how the central nervous system is born within the blastula of that embryo and how the entire brain and central nervous system is formed looks exactly like a tadpole when you open up the fetus. This is heavy stuff for Chemites to have known at this particular time in history because if they knew this, it took them thousands upon thousands of years just to get to that knowledge alone. So you can see how massive this is and what it is that Dr. Ayibo is uncovering and putting down on paper as mathematical um, equations variables within this play. Now, these are the two philosophies that I would like to deal with in terms of the Ibaka <coughs> stone, but I would also like to now move into what, what made me think about this in terms of the unified field theory. And from what I understand, as Dr. Yibo is talking about, is that making everything collapse into one, the integumentary system of the body is everything that is outside the human body, includes skin, Toenail, uh, uh, fingernails, toenails, hair, all that is part of what is known as the integumentary system. Just like you have a circulatory system, a digestive system, the integumentary system is everything on the outside, if you can imagine, with the skin being your largest organ. Max Planck and others, Dr. Yibo can expand in terms of quantum physics. The study of the atom inside, in other words, quantum the quantum physics deals with everything from skin in. Professor Einstein's theories in terms of the special and the general law of relativity that Dr. Yibo was developing and discussing is everything skin out, or the outer world, the stars, everything out here. So the concept of the unified field theory in the research I did is the uniting, is the bridge between the skin out and the skin in. And that they are saying that the same pattern microcosmically follows the same pattern macrocosmically. And that if you understood this unified field theory, that piece that unites outside and inside, that you could then develop a way in which you could call upon the forces of the cosmos at your will. Our African ancestors understood how to do this. Much of their writing deals with these concepts. 
What we have got to do as a people is understand our role in all of this and to recapture this. And I know it's very difficult for anybody to see someone of color dropping this kind of wisdom. But it is not that far-fetched when you know that we taught the world this wisdom. So as we said in the beginning, it is not so much that we are innovating, we are not inventing anything. We are innovating through remembering. We are remembering what we've done in order to take it to another level. Hotel. But I would like to just talk to Dr. Evo <laughs> and, and just get into this because <coughs> I would just like, uh, and, and this is the theory that was printed in our Times Press. When, when was that? So we can Jan get that. January. January, January. 1999. 1999, that's correct. I was, ex I was given this. We have had Dr. Yibo come and present to our community and our children on two occasions. We knew of Dr. Yibo. I knew of his turbulence because the moment he told me about his book and turbulence, I knew that was Patah, which goes back to the Shabaka stone. But when I saw this formula, this just literally, just it, it opened up a whole nother way of looking at this at this particular time. And what I'd like to do is just look at it for the way it is. And I'd like to go through this and talk about the variables with Dr. Yibo so we can get a sense of what it is because, believe me, I'm not that far from many of you. And this is a learning experience for me also. I believe this will change the world. You talk about a new world order. If you wanted a mathematical equation that would be the basis for that new world order, it is this formula. This is a living formula. This is not just math to equate and do. You can do things with this. You can build buildings with this. You can make clothes with this. You can meditate and join the ancestors with this if you understood where, how all this fits. And it's important that we get back into our roots that information you can't use, you wasted your time learning it. I would not waste my time doing this if I did not think it would do something for me and for you and for us as a people. What I'd like to do is look at this yes. from understanding what we just talked about in terms of the uh, comedic <coughs> origin of the universe. Here. I'd like to now take these, just these two. There's a third philosophy that we can get into later, but I just want to deal with these two. And I'd like to take this apart, and I'd like to talk to Dr. Yibo yes. and to see what we can do. Right. Now, what I said, Dr. Yibo, was that G, mm -hmm. as a variable, yes. is the balance what we call the balance of natures. We said that zero, zero, and zero, one, and all of the numbers also had a role in terms of the four pairs. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to get to the little g. This is the large g. We wanted to get to the little g. And so we said that the little g is equal to the physical manifestation. or the boundaries, mm -hmm. the parameters, as Dr. Yibo said, the mm -hmm. boundaries of the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We said that the large N, because mm -hmm. you see that the large N is here. This is the large N. Mm -hmm. We said that the large N mm -hmm. is the sense of the nature or the essence that you cannot see. So therefore, N became what we want to call meta meta. It's the, it's the, the Greek <coughs> uh, name for that letter is Eta. Uh, interesting. Is that right? That's right. You see, now I didn't know that. <laughs> so this, again, this is a building process. And this is, and I think that this discussion should be what the future holds, it's, think tanks. It's exactly this. Interesting. Very interesting. Because then you can see the concept. Yeah. Because remember what N, N is, it's none. This is why this was so attractive to me. Because I never spoke to uh, Dr. Yibo, yet he has put the parameters, he has put the equal sign on the other side to be N, N, which by the way is what the Chemites said was none. It's right there. He's labeled it 
This is how I know he's on the right track. It makes me no difference what any other physicist or mathematician does. For all I'm concerned, they could be right. What I know is Dr. Ayibo is right. And that's a large difference. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, this, <coughs> this variable um, determines the geometry. And um, Einstein had visited this variable in his own way. Uh, Newton visited now. All of them, everyone, you know, visited now. But not in this form, in a simpler form. They visited it, you know, when n equal uh, zero, one or zero. Okay? This n can go from, it's infinity, you know, to 1, 2, 3 to infinity, minus 1, 2, 3 to infinity. You can go in all directions, this entire universe. And that is yeah. the underpinning of Nun. That's right. Nun that's is that's the right. underpinning of everything and all, right. something, nothing. That's right. Well, <coughs> um, the classical results has n is equal to 1. But in that case, so if n is equal to 1, you have t to power 2 here, x to power 2, y to power 2, z to power 2, and that to be five. That is a form of that has been used to generate the results. In that case, they want to say that this and this and this and this are equal. And for 85 years or 100 years, they never went above n equal 1. And this never existed. Mm. Now they can go, n can go to infinity or minus infinity. Mm. They've only dealt with 2. We found the variables that you have put, yes. t yes. is equal to nun nun net. Mm -hmm. X is ha ha het. Yes. Mm. Cock. Mm. Coquette. Mm. And the uh, Z, Z is amen and amenet. This is, this is what we have found. Amen. My brother, <coughs> yes. when you look at this, yes. and you look at this bottom one, yes. One of the keys to understand is that we understand why these variables in place. Yes. T in Medunetel, when you add T, yes. it becomes feminine, yes. which is birth, yes. being born. Yes. We can understand why your first one would be T. Yes. Your X yes. being that variable yes. of ha, ha, het. Yes. The Y, yes. ka, ka, ket. Yes. Because they are natural progressions. Yes. As you end something, yes. you begin something. So therefore, Amen and Amenet yes. clearly could be Z yes. because it is from here the concept now, the metaphor. Yes. You end and you begin again. Yes. When we see the N plus one, we mm -hmm. see this as the metaphor for the law of polarity. Mm -hmm. That for everything that you have, you have its opposite. Mm -hmm. So that this piece, N plus one, mm -hmm. becomes the law of polarity, mm -hmm. which then splits the T, mm -hmm. which makes it Nunnet. You also have here the n plus 1, which makes this ha ha het. Mm -hmm. You have the n plus 1, ka ka ket, amen and amenet. Absolutely. This is astronomy. Yes. This is coming from a brother who wasn't necessarily interested in this, mm -hmm. but sitting at the feet of someone like John Henry Clark, mm -hmm. and then being able to expand in the works of Sheikh Hunter Diop and Theophilio Benga, mm -hmm. teaching children astronomy in kindergarten and first and second grade, wanting to teach them from their perspective we combine it all together. Now, what all that Dr. Yibo has said, I'm saying we can teach the second graders right. on their own metaphoric mature level. level. We can teach it, Absolutely. and they can be the future Absolutely. pyramid builders. Absolutely. They can be the future thinkers Absolutely. of our world because Absolutely. what Dr. Yibo has done is that he has written it down. What I have done is I have theorized it. Mm -hmm. 
I have put it in a context that I could understand so that the community could understand. Yes, yes. The, what's so dynamic about what Brother and I are doing here is that this is a novice. This is you. I'm speaking on your behalf because I'm learning just as you're going through this, I'm learning this. Yes. 